ان الحمد لله تعالى نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان استقى الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار Now we're going to look بإذن الله تعالى at the world of the jinn Why is it important to know about the jinn when we are doing ruqya or we are seeking knowledge of ruqya Inevitably if you are performing ruqya on others whether it be in your family, whether it be in the wider community, inevitably once you start performing ruqya, you're going to come across the jinn. You are going to come across the jinn and this is guaranteed if you're doing ruqya on the wider community. We need to know what the jinn are and what the jinn are not. As it's a part of the unseen, الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ they are, We are those who believe in the unseen. We need to go back to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and see what is mentioned in the Qur'an, in the sunnah, about this creation of the jinn. We need to know about their strengths, we need to know about their weaknesses. We need to know about the difference between that which we find in the revealed sources and that which we know from experience. So again, as our brother has mentioned, we need to distinguish between that which is established by Allah and His Messenger السلام, and that which is established by experience. And we need to understand that if anything from our own experience goes against what is mentioned by Allah or by mentioned by the Messenger السلام, we throw our experience against the wall. Never ever place your experience or what you think you have experienced over the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet As is mentioned in the hadith of Abu Hurairah the Messenger السلام, said about the shayateen or about the shaytan, he has spoken the truth and he is a liar. So subhanallah, we'll look at this hadith later on, but the fact is I just wanted to mention this one statement. He has spoken the truth and he is a liar. So a lot of the shayateen, all they're going to do is constantly lie to you. Constantly lie to you. You need to have a yardstick by which to measure the things that they say. And if we haven't got this yardstick, then subhanallah, we will fall into what a lot of people have fallen into today, where everything is just stories, 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 even though it contradicts what is mentioned in the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet What does the word jinn it mean? So subhanallah, we know about the jinn that this is a creation which is unseen. And the plural form of the word jinn Sorry, jinn is jinni. Sorry, the singular form is jinni and the plural is jinn. And they have characteristics which we as human beings, we do not have. Their characteristics are different to ours. So I want to look at a few things bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. Look at their creation. Look at uh, where were they created before us? Were they created after us? What are they created from? So with regards to their creation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions and the jinn we created before. We created the jinn before from scorching fire. The jinn are created from scorching fire. And in Surah Ar-Rahman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَخَلَقَ الْجَنَّ مِنْ مَارِجٍ مِنْ نَارِ And he created the jinn from the smokeless flame of fire. The jinn were created from a smokeless flame of fire. Ibn Abbas radiallahu an, he said, in reference to this smokeless flame of fire, it means the edge of the flame and in another narration, it is the hottest and purest part of the flame. In the hadith which is recorded by Imam Muslim, our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, she narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the angels were created from light, the jinn were created from a smokeless fire 
and Adam was created from that which has been described to you. What we need to understand, Ya Ikhwan, is that if we know that they are created from fire, we also need to know that this doesn't necessarily mean that they are completely fiery. It's narrated from Aisha radiallahu anha that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was praying. And then the shaitan came to him and tried to seize him. And it, well, it came to him, seized him and threw him on the ground. And then the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, until I felt the coolness of his tongue on my hand. Until I felt the coolness of my tongue on the ground. So subhanallah, the messenger alayhi salatu salam, he seized him and he felt the coolness of his tongue on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And we need to understand that these shayateen, they can see us, but we necessarily in their natural form, we can't necessarily see them. It's extremely important that we understand this principle. That in a natural state, just me and you just going about our business, normally we cannot see the jinn. But the animals, they can see us. And, sorry, the animals, they can see the jinn. And also the jinn can see us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّهُ يُرَاكُمْ هُوَ وَقَبِيلُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا تَرَوْنَهُمْ Indeed, He sees you, He and His tribe, from where you do not see them. So Iblis and his tribe, they see us from where we do not necessarily see them. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, if you hear the crowing of a rooster, then ask Allah for his bounty, for it has seen an angel. And if you hear the braying of a donkey, then seek refuge with Allah from the shaitan, for it has seen a devil. For it has seen a devil. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he also said, if you hear the barking of a dog or the braying of a donkey, then seek refuge for Allah from Allah, for they see what you do not see. So the animals, they can see what we do not necessarily see. It's extremely important that we understand this. We understand that the animals, they can see this. And we as Muslims, we need to be sensitive to our surroundings. So for example, you may be conducting a ruqya session and if you start hearing dogs barking crazily, then maybe this is a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the animals, they are seeing that which you do not see. Seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the shaitan. I want to mention to you brothers and sisters now a few of the things that the jinn are not. The jinn, they are not spirits of the dead. They are not spirits of those people who have died and then they have come back. In what we have in popular culture today, spirits of the dead, we believe that, you know, our mother and father, they have passed away and then the spirits come back and this is the jinn. They are absolutely not. The jinn, they are not all, all powerful. You know, they don't have this power over everything. The jinn, they are not ever living. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kullu man alayha fan. وَيَبْقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِقْرَامِ وَالْإِقْرَامِ SubhanAllah, everything on it is going to perish save the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jinn, they live and they die. So you might come across a jinn which is mocking you saying, oh, well, I've, I'm going to live forever, you can't kill me, etc. We need to understand that jinn, they live and they die. I want to mention now the dif differentiation between the jinn and the shaitan. Do we say that every single jinn is a shaitan? And do we see, say that every shaitan is a jinn? The answer is no. Not all jinn are shayateen. And not all shayateen have to be from the jinn. You have shayateen from amongst mankind and also from amongst the jinn. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, and thus we have made for every prophet an enemy, devils from mankind and jinn. They are devils from within mankind and also from within the jinn. But we need to understand that when we say jinn, we are referring to the whole collective. When we mention the devils amongst them, then we should be saying shayateen. There's a big difference that we need to understand. What about Iblis? Is Iblis, is, was he an angel? Is he a fallen angel? Or is he from the jinn? Iblis is from the jinn. 
Iblis is from the jinn. He is not an angel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ قُلْنَا لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ اسْجُدُوا لِآدَمْ فَسَجَدُوا إِلَّا إِبْلِيسِ كَانَ مِنَ الْجِنِّ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and mention when we said to the angels, prostrate to Adam, and they all prostrated except for Iblis, he was from amongst the jinn. Iblis is from amongst the jinn. And Al Hassan al Basri rahimahullah, he says, Iblis was not one of the angels, not even for the blinking of an eye. Not even for the blinking of an eye. The shayateen from amongst the jinn, they have a very ugly appearance. They are not pleasant to look at. So, whenever we think about a shaytan, we always have a certain image in our mind. We always have a certain image in our mind, something ugly. But subhanAllah, we need to make sure that we don't go overboard with this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah As-Safat about the tree of Zakum. This is a tree which grows in the base of the hellfire. It's a very evil tree it's something that the people of the hellfire will eat from and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions its fruits they are like the heads of devils Allah says this is a tree which grows in the base of the fire and its fruits are like the heads of devils we know that the shaitan he has two horns we know that the shaitan he has two horns again it's an aspect of the unseen we accept it we affirm it but we don't go further in it we don't try and draw pictures or anything like this we accept that the shaitan he has two horns the hadith is in sahih muslim the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said do not pray when the sun is rising or when it is setting because it rises between the two horns of the shaitan the sun rises between the two horns of the shaitan do the jinn eat and drink? Do they have food? The answer is yes. They do eat and they do drink. The Prophet ﷺ commanded Abu Huraira radiallahu an to bring him some stones to clean himself after he had relieved himself. And the Prophet ﷺ said, do not bring bones or dung. So we are forbidden from cleaning ourselves with bones or the dung of animals. And when Abu Huraira radiallahu an, he asked the Messenger of Allah, why, why shouldn't I bring you dung or bones? The Prophet ﷺ said, they are food of the jinn. Dung and bones, they are food of the jinn. A delegation of the jinn of Nusaybin came to me and what good jinn they are. Mention, remember this point now, the Messenger ﷺ, what good jinn they are. And they asked me for provision and I prayed to Allah for them and asked that they should not pass by any bone or dung but that they would find food on it. So subhanAllah, the dung from, the, from our animals is food for their animals and the bones from the food that which we have eaten and we have mentioned the name of Allah, this is for our brothers from amongst the jinn. The Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith which is recorded by Imam Tirmidhi, Do not use dung or bones to clean yourselves, for they are the provision of your brothers from amongst the jinn. In Sahih Muslim, the Messenger ﷺ, he said, A caller from among the jinn came to me, and I went with him and I recited Quran to them. And then Ibn, Mus Abid, Ibn Masud radiallahu an, he said, he took us, the Messenger of Allah took us and showed us their footsteps and the traces of their fires. They asked him for provision and he said, you will have every bone over which the name of Allah has been mentioned. When it falls into your hands, it will have plenty of meat on it. And all droppings are food for your animals. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, Do not use them to clean yourselves after relieving yourselves, for they are the food of your brothers. So subhanAllah, we see that they eat what we have finished with. When we mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we eat and we discard the bones. When it gets into the hands of our brothers from amongst the jinn, they have plenty of food on it. Now this is an aspect of the unseen. We affirm what Allah and His Messenger والسلام, have told us. It's not for us to ask how. It's not for us to ask how when I throw this bone away, then it does, does it have a lot of meat on it for our brothers from amongst the jinn. With regards to eating and drinking, Ya Ikhwan, maybe some of our brothers and sisters, they eat with their left hand. Maybe the person you've done ruqya on them, and they come back and they ask for a drink of water and you notice that instead of taking it with their right hand they take it with their left hand 
This is one of the characteristics of shaitan. The Prophet wasallam, he said, when any one of you eats, let him eat with his right hand. And when he drinks, let him drink with his right hand. For the shaitan eats with his left hand and drinks with his left hand. How do we take this hadith now and make it practical and useful for when we are doing ruqya? If, for example, you give the person some drink and this person normally drinks with his right hand, he eats with his right hand and he takes it with his left hand, you know that he is being influenced by the shaitan. You know that that jinn perhaps he's pretending to be this individual. It might not be that individual, it might actually be the shaitan who wants to drink. So he drinks with his left hand. In this situation, don't let him drink obviously. Take it from him and give it to him in his right hand. When we enter into our homes, the Prophet ﷺ said, when a man enters his house and mentions Allah upon entering and when eating, the shaitan says, there is no place for you to stay and no dinner. If he enters his house and he does not mention Allah upon entering, the shaitan says, you have a place to stay. And if he does not mention when eating, the shaitan says, you have a place to stay and you have dinner. Imagine this now, we walk into our homes and we don't mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we enter into our homes. You are inviting shaitan into your house. You are inviting shaitan into your home. So the shaitan will say to him and his people, they will say you have a place to stay here tonight. You can stay with this person, he didn't mention Allah when he entered. And then you come and you eat. And you don't mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shaitan will say to his troops, you have a place to stay and you have food. So you are inviting the devils into your own home. This emphasizes to us the importance of the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Making mention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and making the a correct adhkar in whatever we do. When we mention Allah, when we mention Tawheed, when we mention the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it closes the door for the shaitan. It closes the door for the shaitan. The jinn, they multiply and they marry. They get married and they have children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when mentioning about uh, Iblis, when he refused to prostrate to Adam alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Then will you take him and his descendants as allies other than me, whilst they are enemies to you? <laughs> will you take him and his descendants as allies over me, whilst they are your enemies? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when mentioning about the Hul al-Ain in Jannah, the women of Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions how they haven't been touched by men or by jinn. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that they haven't been touched by men or by jinn. And Qatada rahimahullah, he said, the children of the shaitan, they produce offspring, just as the children of Adam produce offspring, but they are greater in number. The shayateen, based on this, and based on what we've mentioned of experience, the shayateen, they do fall in love with human beings. They don't just fall in love with themselves, amongst themselves. So if the sister leaves her home and she has beautified herself and she has not you know, adorned the correct hijab and she is making an open display of her beauty, then subhanallah, it's very, very possible that a jinn will look at her and desire her, fall in love with her and will perhaps seek to possess her. And the same thing for the brothers as well. So this is why we need to be in a constant state of remembrance of Allah. As our brother has mentioned, our aqidah is our shield. Our, our taqwa is our defense. So we need to have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, observe the limits in the way that we dress, in the way that we act and the way that we behave. The jinn, some of them have the ability to move very quickly from one place to another. They can move huge distances in the blinking of an eye. Sulaiman alayhi salam, when the queen of Sheba, the, the, the bird, it said, I've come from this people and they are worshipping others besides Allah and this woman she has a mighty throne she has a huge throne so Sulaiman alayhi salam 
he basically cut, cutting the sh story short he sent them some da'wah you need to embrace Islam etc etc so the Queen of Sheba now decides to come and visit Sulaiman alayhi salam so Sulaiman alayhi salam he says and let's not forget Sulaiman alayhi salam Allah gave him control of the jinn Allah gave him control of the jinn he was in command of the jinn they would work for him they would do things for him so Sulaiman alayhi salam he said to the people who were in front of him men and jinn who is going to bring me her throne bearing in mind it's in a different place it's in a different city or a different country and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that an ifrit a powerful one from amongst the jinn said I will bring it to you before you rise from your place and indeed for this responsibility or for this task I am strong and trustworthy so this jinn is saying before you can stand up I will bring you this throne before you can stand up from where you are I will bring you this throne so the point here is they can travel large distances in a short space of time the jinn they also have the ability to ascend very high up they have the ability to descend very high up in the times before the coming of the Prophet wasallam, the jinn they used to ascend to these high places and they used to try and eavesdrop, try and listen in on the news or the decree that has been given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Jannah. But after that, after the coming of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that the jinn said, and we have sought to reach the heaven, but we have found it full or guarded filled with powerful guards and burning flames and we used to sit therein in positions for hearing but whoever listens now will find a burning flame lying in wait for him so before the coming of the messenger alayhi salam the jinn they would form a chain and they would rise high up and they would try and listen to the decree that is given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and try and listen to the angels mentioning it amongst themselves in Jannah they would then bring this news down to the fortune teller and the fortune teller would then tell the people after the coming of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam the heavens were filled with gods they were filled with shooting stars and shooting flames and so the shayateen they weren't able to do this as freely the hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and this just going in a bit more detail the messenger of Allah alayhi salatu salam he said when Allah decrees a matter in the heavens the angels they beat their wings in submission with what he says with a sound like the chain beating on a rock imagine you have a metallic chain beating on a rock this is what the angels the wings of the angels when they're beating this is what they sound like this is they do this out of the fear and awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then when fear is banished from their hearts the angels they say between them what has your Lord said they begin to ask one another what has Allah said they say the truth Allah has said the truth and he is the most high the most great so those who are trying to eavesdrop those who are trying to eavesdrop they hear it and those who are trying to eavesdrop are standing one above the other so he hears a word and passes it on to the one who is beneath him who passes it on in turn until it reaches the lips of the sorcerer and the soothsayer so let's explain this now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees a matter in Jannah the angels out of awe and fear of Allah they begin to beat their wings then after a while when the fear has been banished the angels begin to talk between themselves what has your Lord decreed and the angels they say the truth and he is the most high the most great then the shayateen what they do is they form a chain one above the other above the other above the other and they try and listen in to what the angels are saying try and listen in to the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then what happens is they pass that truth down and once that what has been mentioned they pass it down until it reaches the soothsayer or the sorcerer and the messenger alayhi salam he continued sometimes the flaming fire will hit him before he passes it on and sometimes he will pass it on before he is hit and he tells 100 lies along with it 100 lies along with it they will never give you the truth on its own they will add 100 lies into the ear of the fortune teller and then the messenger alayhi salatu salam 
he told us this is the nature of us people we go to the fortune teller which is obviously forbidden but we go to the fortune teller or the person goes to the fortune teller and the fortune teller says this 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 he tells him like a hundred things 99 lies and one truth and the messenger alayhi salam told us then when the people hear that one truth or when that one truth comes true they hold on to it they forget the 99 things that the fortune teller got wrong but they hold on to the one truth and say subhanallah didn't he tell us isn't this what he said exactly what he said has taken place so subhanallah this is how the shayateen they rise high up one above the other and then they bring that news back down into the ears of the fortune teller the shayateen or the jinn they have the ability to change shape they have the ability to change shape this is a fairly lengthy hadith but i'll mention it insha'allah uh, a man came to abu huraira radiallahu an and Abu Hurair radiallahu ta'ala an, he was guarding the Bayt al-Mal of the Muslims. He was guarding the money of the Muslims. And a man came and the man tried to steal from the wealth of the Muslims. Abu Hurair radiallahu an, he caught him. He said, I'm going to take you to the Messenger of Allah. He said, look, I have a family. I'm poor. Let me go. Let me go. So the Abu Hurair radiallahu an, he goes back to the Messenger of Allah and the Messenger of Allah alayhi salam, he says, who is your guest? Tell me about who visited you because this has come from Jibreel alayhi salam. Who has visited you? It's been revealed to the Messenger of Allah. And he tells him what happened. And the Messenger of Allah alayhi salam says he's going to come again tomorrow. Again, that tomorrow night, Abu Hurair radiallahu an, is guarding the wealth of the Muslims. He catches this man trying to steal again. He catches him trying to steal again, subhanAllah. It goes on like this until he catches him and says, I'm definitely going to take you to the Messenger of Allah. So then the man teaches him Ayatul Kursi. This man teaches him Ayatul Kursi and says, if you re recite it at night, Allah will appoint for you a guard until the morning. He teaches him some about the virtues of reciting Ayatul Kursi. So Abu Huraira again, he goes back and he narrates this to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then the Messenger of Allah asked him, do you know who that was, O Abu Huraira? And he says, Allah and his Messenger know best. He says, that was shaitan. Shaitan came to you. That was shaitan and he spoke the truth and he is a liar. His natural condition is one of telling lies. But in this situation, he has told you the truth. The point here, he came in the form of a man. He came in the form of a man to Abu Huraira radiallahu an. I want to mention now to you brothers and sisters some of the weaknesses of the shayateen some of the things that they can't do some of the you know subhanallah we read about this they can do this they can do this perhaps the muslim he begins to feel some fear of them but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says inna kayd shaytan kana da'ifa indeed the plot of shaytan it is weak the plot of shaytan it is weak and in another Part of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Indeed, over my believing slaves, you have no authority, and sufficient is your Lord as a disposer of affairs. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us here. The plot of shaitan, he it is weak. The plot of shaitan, it is weak. And we as Muslims, if we have taqwa, if we are upon tawheed, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us nothing to fear and they won't be able to harm us the way they would be able to harm uh, you know, somebody who is upon the false aqidah, somebody who's not practicing. The shayateen, they fear some people and they flee from them. The shayateen fear people. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told Umar radiallahu an, the shaitan is certainly afraid of you, O Amr. And I can see the devils among the jinn and mankind running away from Amr. Amr radiallahu an, the shayateen, they were afraid of him. They were afraid of him. And in a hadith which is recorded by uh, Imam al-Bukhari, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, by the one in whose hand is my soul, no devil sees you walking along a path except that he takes a different path. Why was this? Was this because of the physical nature of Umar radiallahu an? No, rather it was due to his taqwa. Rather it was due to his iman. Rather it was due to his tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a glad tiding for us as Muslims. If we are upon the aqeedah 
of the Salaf as Salih, if we are implementing the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if we do our best to stay away from sins, we put our trust in Allah, then the Shayateen, they will begin to fear us. This is established. The Shayateen, they begin to fear you. So many times you go for Ruqya, before you even begin, the Jinn is already scared. He's already scared, don't harm me, please don't hurt me. Because of your aqeedah, because of your tawheed, because of your tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The shayateen, they cannot enter a door which has been locked and the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been mentioned over it. So when you go into your homes, close your doors and say Bismillah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, when nightfall comes or when evening comes, keep your children inside. For the devil spread out at that time. Then when one hour of the night has passed, let them out again and lock the doors and mention the name of Allah. For the shaitan cannot open a locked door. So you lock that door, you mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't even have the ability to open that door. They don't even have the ability to open the door. Subhanallah, look, why are we fearing them? Why do we feel some apprehension in our hearts? We're going to come across a jinn. I don't want to do ruqya because I've never met a jinn. I've never, you know, come face to face with a jinn. Subhanallah, they don't even have the ability to open a door over which the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been mentioned. What about the heart which is full of tawheed? What about the heart which is full upon reliance upon Allah and love of Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Is there truly anything to fear there's absolutely nothing to fear some of the jinn again jinn not shaitan some of the jinn they listened to the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and they accepted islam at the beginning of surah al-jinn allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions say it has been revealed to me that a group of the jinn they listened to this quran and they said indeed we have heard an amazing quran it guides to the right way and we have believed in it and we will never associate anyone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it teaches and it teaches the exalted in the nobleness of our Lord. He has not taken a wife nor has he taken a son. This is what the jinn was saying. So some jinn came and they went back and they were upon Tawheed. We're never going to associate partners with Allah. Allah is free of taking a wife and of taking a son. This Quran is magnificent. So subhanallah, some of them came to the messenger alayhi salatu salam and they accepted Islam. Ya ikhwan, we need to understand that the jinn, they have different religions. They have different religions like we do. You have Hindus, Buddhists, Christians, Jews, atheists, agnostics, Muslims. They have different religions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions وَإِنَّ مِنَّ الصَّالِحُونَ وَمِنَّا دُونَ ذَلِكَ كُنَّا طَرَائِقَ قِدَادًا They are amongst those, some who are righteous and some to the contrary. Some who are righteous Muslims and others to the contrary. We are groups, each having a different way. Each having a different religion. Subhanallah. And elsewhere, we need to understand, Ya Ikhwan, giving da'wah to the jinn now. I don't, in fact, we won't mention this. We won't mention this because I think we'll mention this in the Rukya session. Now I want to mention about seeking the aid from the good jinn. Seeking the aid from the good jinn. Is it permissible to seek aid from the good jinn? This is something about which many of the people who do Rukya according to Quran and Sunnah in inverted commas and they fool the people with ayat of Quran, they fool the people with ahadith, they're using good jinn. They are using good jinn to so-called assist them in their mission of doing ruqya. The first thing, ya ikhwan, is we need to understand. Can we see the jinn? The answer is no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says that if an evildoer comes to you with some news, fatabayyanu, <laughs> seek clarification of that which he is telling you. Now when this jinn comes to you and says, I am a Muslim, I want to help you, I want to aid you in your mission. How on earth do you know that this jinn is even Muslim? How on earth do you clarify that this jinn is not a shaitan which is going to mislead you? How on earth do you come to the conclusion that this jinn is sincere in seeking to assist you? That's the first thing. The second thing is we have mentioned that we follow the Quran and the Sunnah. 
Nowhere in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do we ever find that the Messenger Alayhi Salatu Salam sought aid from the good jinn. Never did he ever do this. This is the second thing. The third thing is that this is one of the gateways which will lead you into shirk. Once they have you hooked, say this, call upon me by this, you are going to fall into worship of them. And they won't, in reality, they're not going to work for you unless they give or they gain some element of benefit. They're not going to work from you, work for you unless you do acts to seek nearness to them, closeness to them. They're not just going to do this. If, however, subhanallah, you are in the middle of a ruqya session, as has happened before, you're in the middle of a ruqya session and some good jinn, they decide to help you. Okay, you haven't asked for it, you haven't called upon them, you haven't requested it from them, then again, you don't need to worry. If they want to help you, they help you, but you did not request it. You continue with your recitation of Quran. Does everybody understand this? You continue with your recitation of Quran. I don't want anybody to stop the Rukya session and say, okay, how can we help one another? How can we come closer to one another? Again, you are doing Rukya, you are reciting on your brothers and sisters, and this is enough for us bi Allahi ta'ala. I want to mention now some of the uh, things relating to possession, jinn possession. Many of our you know, people from this ummah, they say that jinn possession, it doesn't exist. Jinn possession, it doesn't exist. One of the abilities of the jinn that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to them, this is a, 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 an ability given by Allah, and it happens with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that they can possess an individual. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Baqarah about the person who deals in interest. And they eat riba. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says those who eat riba, they will not stand on the day of resurrection except like the standing of a person beaten by shaitan, leading him to insanity. The touch of shaitan. They are not going to stand on the day of resurrection except by the one, like the one who has been touched by a shaitan, which has led them to insanity. Another proof for this is the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he said the shaitan flows through the veins or flows through the son of Adam like his blood. The shaitan flows through the son of Adam like his blood. And also the ijma' of all of the scholars of Ahlus Sunnah. <laughs> there is consensus. Ibn, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah mentions consensus from the scholars of Ahlus Sunnah that the shaitan they are, or the jinn they can possess a person. A person is most vulnerable to possession when they have become heedless of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When they have forgotten Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you find that at extremes, extremes of emotion, this is when a person becomes open to being possessed. So extremes of happiness, extremes of stress, extremes of worry, extremes of, of grief, all of these type of things, when you go to the extreme and this you know, it almost overcomes you. SubhanAllah, it's like a door it seems to open up and the shayateen, they have this ability to more easily possess this individual. When we go to places of filth, places of isolation, that those places where men or humans do not normally visit, then we need to seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the jinn from the shayateen, from amongst the jinn. This is where they remain. So places of filth like the bathroom, places of filth like where the rubbish, uh, where, the, where the garbage and the rubbish is dumped, places are like graveyards, those places which are isolated, places like caves, you go out to a far away place. They live under places like trees. Do not go up and urinate under a tree. These types of places, this is where the shayateen, they reside. And this is why we make dua, we make this protection, we put our trust in Allah when we go to such places. Why does jinn possession occur? Why does jinn possession occur? There are three main reasons why jinn possession it occurs. The first reason is as a, as a means of revenge. 
So the individual, he has maybe stepped on the jinn, he has harmed the jinn, he's thrown some boiling water, he's poured away some boiling water and he didn't know that there was some jinn there, he's harmed the jinn. He was in a car, he threw something out of his window, he never realized that there was a jinn there. And as a result of that, this individual has caused harm to the jinn and so the jinn as revenge, they possess this person. The second thing is out of love is out of love. So the jinn sees this individual, falls in love with them, begins to fall in love with them, begins to desire them, tries to possess them. The third reason is they have been sent by the magician. The jinn are being sent on a mission to possess this individual. So they didn't come as a result of revenge or as a result of love, although these two motives may develop later on. So he goes there, he sees the woman, falls in love with the woman. The person recites Qur'an, he wants to take revenge now because he's being burnt by Qur'an. So these three are the main reasons of jinn possession. What are some common, common signs of jinn possession now? And before we mention this, we need to emphasize that because, just because a person may be displaying or exhibiting one of these signs doesn't necessarily mean that the person is possessed. Or the person may not have any of these signs that we are going to mention and yet the person is still possessed. Every single case, take it on its merit. Don't just think, okay, I've seen this before and subhanAllah, this person is now possessed. I want to mention some of the common signs. Sudden, rapid changes in personality and split personality. The person goes from extremes of being happy, extremes of laughter, to suddenly crying, to extremes of worry and extremes of stress and grief. They are literally from one extreme to the other and it happens in the blinking of an eye. For no apparent reason, the person is sitting there laughing and then suddenly he starts crying. The person is there happy, suddenly he starts you know, getting very angry, he starts becoming extremely agitated. Another sign is a change in the facial structure or the voice. So, you may say, how does a person's facial structure change? The nose is the same, the eyes are the same, the mouth is the same, but subhanAllah, you will see another face on that person's face. You know what they say, you know, it looked like his face changed. It didn't look like it was him. It looked like it was somebody else. Subhanallah, this is one of the signs of jinn possession that the person becomes extremely angry. When we become angry, our facial you know, expressions, they do change. When we become happy, they do change. But this person's face, it looks completely different. It looks completely different. It's very hard to describe unless you've actually seen it happen in front of you. Or his voice changes. So you might find a man's voice coming out of a woman's mouth. You might find a woman's voice coming out of a man's mouth. Or perhaps the person, he doesn't speak, uh, for example, Arabic. He doesn't know Arabic, but suddenly now he's speaking fluent Arabic. He hasn't learnt it and suddenly out of the blue he's speaking fluent Arabic. Or what is very common, uh, especially amongst the Asian communities, people in this country, we don't speak our languages. Perhaps we don't speak Urdu. But then subhanAllah, immediately overnight this person becomes fluent in Urdu. This person becomes fluent in a particular language. This is because this is the language that is spoken by the jinn that is possessing that individual. This is the language that is spoken by the jinn that is possessing that individual. Sudden displays of extreme emotion at inappropriate times. When the Quran is recited, the person starts laughing. You're in a, a, a gathering, which is perhaps you're in a, um, you know, there's been a funeral. And it's not appropriate to just start laughing and this person just sitting there just bursts out laughing for no apparent reason. Unexplained changes of emotion, extreme uh, you know, emotions. Telltale sign now, an aversion or reaction to the Qur'an or to the Adhan. Telltale sign now. So the Qur'an 
As soon as somebody is reciting Quran, perhaps the person is at home and their mother or father just opens the Mus'haf and just says, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem, Bismillahi Rahman Rahim, and they begin to recite Surah Al Fatiha. The person becomes very angry, very agitated, walks out the room, begins screaming, tells them to stop. Or the Adhan, even on TV, the Adhan which is played over TV, and we play it in our homes at the time of Salah, SubhanAllah, the person leaves the room. As soon as the Adhan is, you know, the beginning of the Adhan, he leaves the room. He's the first person out of the room. He doesn't want to be in the home. Sometimes even the person is reciting to themselves. You know, like your mom is reciting to herself. And subhanAllah, the person who is possessed can't hear the Quran, but is becoming, you know, upset simply because somebody is reciting Quran in the house. Simply because it is being recited in the home. Sudden inexplicable illnesses. Sudden inexplicable illnesses. So the person is going from one illness to the other, to the other. It's unexplained. You go for all of the checks, all of the tests and checkups. Nothing's coming back. Everything is fine, yet you yourself are falling ill. But again, Ikhwan, you may have a vitamin deficiency. You may have a bad diet. So again, one of these signs doesn't necessarily link to jinn possession. Doesn't necessarily link to jinn possession. When the person complains of, they feel ants crawling over their body. So the person feels, he says, you know, I sit here and it feels like something is crawling over my body. Or I'm sitting here now and I can feel palpitations in my heart. I can feel something moving through me. They'll actually say this, I can literally feel the, the, there's something moving in my blood. There's something moving through my body. Or you're sat there and the person is just twitching unexplainably. The person is just twitching, 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 twitching. Again, this might not be a sign, but it may also be a, a, a subtle sign that there are jinn involved. Compression in the chest. So the person finds that their chest is becoming very, very tight. Or they might find it difficult to breathe. Or they find difficulty breathing. Especially when the Quran is recited, they feel as if their chest is closing in, they feel suffocated, they have this difficulty breathing. Epilepsy or fits and fainting. So out of the blue, the person just starts fitting. Out of the blue, the person just faints. And then they get back up and there's nothing wrong with them. They don't remember anything. They don't remember a single thing. It's just like they were just walking and they fainted or they walked into the masjid, they fainted, they got back up and they don't remember anything. The person may like to be in places of filth. So you might find that the person spends three or four hours in the bathroom. He just goes to the bathroom and he just sits there. Doesn't need the bathroom, doesn't need to use the toilet. He just sits on the toilet because he feels peace in the toilet. He feels peace in the bathroom. Why? This is where the shayateen like to reside. This is where the shayateen, they like to stay, they like to remain. So he will go there and he will just stay there. Other times you might find a, a person in the middle of the night, he gets up and he just walks into the middle of a park. Just walks into the park and just sits under a tree. Just becomes like a complete vegetable, just sat there for hours on end in the middle of the night under a tree. Again, very telltale sign of jinn possession. Or the person, he may feel peace in the graveyard. How many times does the person, he goes and they just want to sit in the graveyard. He has this overwhelming urge to just go and sit in the graveyard. And there's no real reason why. We may also find an extreme increase in their physical strength. In their physical strength, their physical ability, they become extremely strong, they become violent and subhanAllah you need a few people just to hold them down. Just to restrain them, they get extreme physical strength, physical ability. It's not unknown for you know, our sisters to be able to overcome four or five men when they are possessed. And they will just throw them off, they will throw them off. And this is due to the physical ability of the jinn being inside of them. Let's look now, ya ikhwan, at the link between the shayateen and the sahib. Let's look at the link between the jinn and the magician. Firstly, what we need to establish is this is a relationship of mutual loss. A mutual loss. There's no benefit, there's no goodness that comes from this pact. It's a pact of mutual loss, mutual destruction. 
What do the shayateen want? The shayateen, they want to be honored. They want to be raised. They want to be worshipped besides Allah. They want to attach the hearts of the people to others besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more a magician lowers himself, the more the jinn will be willing to do to work for him. So it's like a scale. Imagine a scale. The more he humiliates himself, the more he humiliates Quran and disrespects Allah and the Prophet wasallam, the lower he stoops, the more the jinn will be willing to do in his service. The shayateen, what is their ultimate aim, ya ikhwan, is to take as many people with them to the fire of Jahannam as they possibly can. Iblis said, oh Allah, because you have sent me astray, I'm going to wait for them on your straight path. And I'm going to come from in front of them and behind them from their left and from their, from their right and from their left. And you're not going to find most of them as grateful. Except for a few of your believing slaves. So the point here is Iblis, he is the head. He is the shaitan. And his aim is to take as many of the children of Adam to the hellfire with him as possible. So of course his troops are going to have the same aim, the same goal, the same objective. What do the jinn want? They want the sahir to do acts of obedience. They want the sahir to humiliate himself. And they want the sahir not only to commit shirk himself. This is not enough. If he commits shirk himself, but doesn't call other people to it, the jinn will not work for him. This is an extremely important principle that we need to understand. If the sahir does not call others to the shirk, the jinn won't work for him. They will only work for him if he commits it and he also you know, calls other people to the same thing. What's the role of the sahir? What's the role of the jinn in enforcing and enacting the magic? I want to give you an example now. Somebody wants to do magic on an individual and perhaps there's a bit of overlap here, but it will give us the, an understanding of how the jinn work. Somebody wants to do magic on an individual, so he takes an item of his clothing, he takes some of his hair, he takes a picture, he takes jewelry, underwear, whatever it might be. He takes it to the magician. This, pers this thing has the person's DNA or like a picture of the individual so he can identify. He takes it to the magician. The magician will do these acts towards the shayateen. And we'll talk about this in more detail later, inshallah. He does these acts of obedience, acts of worship to the shayateen. The shayateen will then say, okay, what do you want us to do? The magician will then identify from the hair, from the photograph, from the person's name and date of birth and mother's name, etc. He will identify that person. I want you to go and split him from his wife. I want you to go and destroy him to try and kill him. Why do we need a scent? Imagine the example that is used and it's a good example. Imagine you see these, you know, these police programs and the criminal, he goes and he hides in the middle of the forest in the middle of the night. So what do they do? They bring in the police dogs. They bring in the police dogs and they give the dogs a scent of this individual. They make him smell his his, his, his adrenaline or his clothes or they give some scent and the dogs from this scent they will go and they will find this individual in the middle of the forest. This is the same way. The shayateen, they need a scent and then they will go and find that person, identify that person and then the problems will begin. We mentioned jinns possess. Do Muslim jinns possess? Do Muslim jinns possess people? The answer is yes. Muslim jinns do possess people. It may be through revenge. So this person, he is running through the park, he steps on the, the, the jinn's children or the jinn himself, causes some damage, causes some harm. The jinn is Muslim but wants revenge. Okay? In this situation, you explain, we can't see you, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, etc. etc. Through sihr, the answer is yes. The Muslim jinns, sometimes they are sent against their will. They didn't want to be sent, but they are sent through their will, against their will. 
So the Sahir, he will call upon the, the king of the jinn. They have different tribes. They will call upon the, the king of the jinn or somebody who is powerful from amongst the jinn, from amongst the shayateen. That shaytan will then send his foot soldiers. The same way the army general, he doesn't go fight himself. He sends the foot soldiers. So they will capture this person, this jinn, and they will say, if you do not fulfill this pact, we're going to kill you. If you do not fulfill this pact, we are going to kill your family, we are going to kill your children. Many, many times, this is what the shaitan or the jinn will say, is Muslim, but I don't want to leave because if I leave and I don't fulfill the pact, they're going to kill me. They're going to kill my children. They're going to kill my family. So subhanAllah, they can be forced, it's a Muslim, they can be forced against their will, against their will. An important thing, ya ikhwan, is before we try and kill the jinn, we should give it the opportunity to leave. We should give it the opportunity to leave, lest we oppress this jinn. We don't want to oppress. We give the opportunity, we say, look, before I begin reciting, I'm giving you the opportunity to leave. If you don't leave, you're an oppressor, I will kill you and I expect reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you're oppressing my brother in Islam. So give them the opportunity to leave. If they don't want to leave, then Bismillah, we can kill them and we can take care of them by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Other things, Ya Ikhwan, um, what, I've, what we've mentioned here, I need to emphasize that some of the things that we have mentioned here, you may come across this. But it may not necessarily be jinn possession. Or you may come across something else and it leads to jinn possession. For example, uh, the person, if the jinn is in love with the person, then it may lead that person to constant masturbation. And this is how the jinn has intercourse with this individual. This is how the jinn fulfills its desires. Or the person is constantly seeing in his dream a certain individual, a certain man or a certain woman, he is having relations with that person. He is having relations with that individual who he's never met before. This may lead to jinn possession, or this may be jinn possession. So subhanAllah, this is by no means an exhaustive list. This is by no means, uh, you know, like if it's not on this list, then it's not jinn possession. If it's on this list, it's definitely jinn possession. You may come across other things. And this is where experience is so important. This is where experience is so important. The final thing that I want to mention, and then I'll hand over to our brother Muhammad if he wants to add anything or, or correct me on anything, is the virtues of cupping, the virtues of hijama. The Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned that the shaitan, he flows through the son of Adam like his blood. They flow through like the, our blood. Okay, many times, subhanAllah, you are doing ruqya on a person, you can see the lump moving through their body. You can see the jinn moving through their veins like their blood. So you will see the twitch in the finger. You'll see the twitch in the finger, you grab the finger, the person screams and screams and screams. Why? You've grabbed the jinn. You haven't grabbed the person. You've grabbed the jinn that is in that person's finger. Okay? Or it will, it will, you'll, you know, you'll go to grab it and suddenly the twitch moves to the other hand. Or it goes to the leg. Or it goes to the chest. The pectoral area is just like, you know, pumping away. Or you might see it literally moving in his veins around his neck and this is because they move in the way our blood moves around us. So hijama, by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sometimes the jinn can come out in the blood. So as the blood is taken out, as the blood is removed in the hijama, this is an amazing thing, <laughs> subhanAllah sometimes the jinn is removed in this way. So ya ikhwan, the world of the jinn, it is literally another world. It is literally another world. But remember, they are created like we are created for the same purpose. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I did not create the jinn and mankind except to worship me alone. And the Prophet wasallam, he was sent as a messenger for us and for them. Okay, so the way we need to obey Allah, follow the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's upon them as well. So they don't have a different religion or different messengers. La. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was sent to all of the worlds. His message, it is universal and it will stay until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. 
So there's nothing wrong with, you know, if a Muslim, if a jinn tells you it's Muslim, you don't necessarily need to disregard that. I'll hand over to Muhammad, inshallah, if he's got anything to add. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa wa ala. Couple of very small things that I just wanted to add at this point. Little things to remind you. In one of the earlier sessions, I mentioned the ayah in Surah Al-An'am and the ayah in Surah Yunus. And in Surah Yunus, That if Allah Azza wa Jal wants good for you, not why Allah Azza wa Jal wants to touch you with something, nothing can remove it but Him. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for you, there is nothing that can repel His virtue or His bounty. I mentioned this ayah, and now I want to mention to you another ayah. And this second ayah that I'm going to mention to you, the first one was to remind you that all help and harm comes from Allah. This is to remind you never, ever, ever to fear the jinn. And if you find yourself fearing the jinn, I don't say read this ayah as a sunnah, that the ayah is a sunnah that you read when you fear the jinn. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that perhaps this ayah will remind you who you should be fearing. If you were to recite it. إِنَّمَا ذَلِكُمُ الشَّيْطَانِ يُخَوِّفُ أَوْلِيَاءَ فَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ وَخَافُونِ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ This is only the shaytan who makes you fear his allies. The shaytan wants you to fear the jinn. He wants you to fear his allies. He wants you to be t so terrified. Wallah, just, just yesterday we had someone phone up who cannot open the mushaf because they are so terrified of what is going to happen to them from the jinn. إِنَّمَا ذَلِكُمُ الشَّيْطَانِ This is only the shaytan. يُخَوِّفُ أَوْلِيَاءَ And for those of you who know Arabic here, يُخَوِّفُ أَوْلِيَاءَ doesn't mean that he makes you scared, he makes his friends scared. It means يُخَوِّفُ كُمْ أَوْلِيَاءَ He makes you scared of his allies. He makes you scared of the jinn. What does Allah Azza wa Jal say? فَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ Don't be scared of them. وَخَافُونِي Be scared of me. إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ You should be scared of the creator of the jinn who can touch you wherever you are. You can run and you can escape the jinn. You can run and escape the hands of the people. But wallahi, you can't run and escape Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So keep in your mind this ayah. This ayah is in Surah Al Imran, ayah number 175. Indeed, this is only the shaitan who makes you scared of his supporters, so do not fear them, but fear me if you are truly believers. And the only other thing that I had to add, and there's so much to add on this topic, but it was a question someone asked a few moments ago, and I think it's maybe relevant to mention here. We talked about some of the issues of the jinn and what the jinn like and, and purifying the house, and I think we're going to talk about this in a lot more detail when we come down to the Raqi and his family, inshallah about keeping the house pure and about making your dua before you go into the house and so on and so forth. What do you do if you're sharing a house with somebody and the person you're sharing a house with is not practicing the sunnah and is not saying bismillah and is not, you know, is not uh, doing what they should be doing? Golden principle in many of the affairs of the religion. فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ Fear Allah as much as you are able to fear Allah. If you can't remove the pictures and the idols from the house, at least remove them from your bedroom. If you can't force somebody to, to remember Allah when they go in the bathroom, at least make sure that you and your family and your children do. So don't worry about what you can't control because Allah will suffice you in what you can't control. But Allah asks you to make an effort in those things that you can control. So when we talk about Al-Aqd bil Asbab, we talk about doing the things that Allah has put for us to do on this earth. What we mean is you do the best that you can with what you have available. Someone says, I want to do Ruqya, but I can't read Al-Baqarah. I don't know how. I haven't memorized it. I can't read very well. Say, Alhamdulillah, read, read, قُلْ عَوْضُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَىٰ قُلْ عَوْضُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ Fear Allah as much as you can. You don't have to have everything there all the time. And this happens to a lot of people. They say, okay, I understand about the jinn, but I have family members who are inadvertently <laughs> inviting the jinn into the home. 
We say to them, fear Allah as much as you can. If you can leave, you can leave. If you can't leave and you must stay there, at least keep your room an area which is protected from the shayateen. At least encourage the members of the family you can. Fear Allah as much as you are able. And I think inshallah ta'ala that's more than enough for this topic. It is an introduction. It is not the be all and end all. And there are many, many, many other things. You're just beginning a journey. And I remember what? Our Shaykh said to us once, Shaykh Ali bin Ghazi, Hafizahullah, he said to me, Ya Muhammad, if you continue in this knowledge, Satar al Ajaib, you will see things that you cannot imagine that you would see. You will see the strangest appearances and things that you could not have imagined you would have seen. And there's much to learn about the jinn. But what we're giving people are principles and a basic understanding from which you can build and which you can learn, distinguishing, as we've said time and time again, between what is narrated in the sunnah and what is something which is from experience. Take experience into account, but don't put it ahead of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. With regard to the, the point that uh, our brother mentioned, Allah regarding this, uh, regarding the Muslim jinn helping, I'll tell you a little story. We have a few jinn stories. We can have a, li a, a little bit of jinn story. We were in the masjid, myself and one of the brothers who is with us here today, and we were reciting upon a lady, and uh, we were reciting upon a lady and a brother, and I don't know, can't remember which one of the two it was when, when, which we were reciting on. They're related in the same family. And when we were reciting upon them, immediately the person changed their demeanor and they gave salam. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And when we looked, and I believe it was the brother, when we looked, it was a very strange occurrence. And I said, what happened? And the brother, he said, he said, while you were reciting, I saw two figures that appeared to me as though in my eyes, it appeared to me like they were the jinn. That's how it appeared in my eyes. And they said to me, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So I replied to their salam. And they said, we are jinn from the Muslims and we would like to help you. And the brother, mashallah, look how we teach the people and look how we emphasize to the people. What did the brother say? He said, Jazakallahu khairan, I have no need of your help. I trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever you do, you do for the sake of Allah. Alhamdulillah, I have my Lord who will protect me. Or words to that effect. This is what we're encouraging people to do. And so those two jinn, they came and they discussed amongst each other and they said to him, we will help you. So they came and they pulled. He said, I could see them reach into me and I felt the jinn that was within me, the evil jinn within me, go out. And they held him on the floor in front of me while the brother was reading the rukia. And this is something we couldn't see it. And we have no way of knowing the authenticity from the lack of authenticity. But the point that I want to make to you here is look at the reaction of the brother. Jazakallahu khairan. May Allah reward you with good. But I have my Lord who will protect me. Whatever you wish to do, you do for the sake of Allah. And you will find it with Allah on the day of judgment. But I'm not going to command you because as soon as you start to work with them and command them what happens, you'll end up going astray. You will end up potentially misguiding those good jinn and turning them into shayateen that misguide the people. So out of your respect for your brothers from the jinn, we don't work with the Muslim jinn. They have their job and they do it and they will get their reward in the sight of Allah. And we have our role and we do it and we will get our reward in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's just a little, a little bit of a, a story just to, to sort of emphasize how important it is that you tell people about their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that you don't get people because we have ruqa, good ruqa, who have gone astray because they sought help from the Muslim jinn. They have gone astray to the point where they've almost become like magicians because they sought help from the Muslim jinn. And they said, oh, I have this jinn and he's a Muslim and he beats up the shayateen and it's so much quicker than what I'm doing. And subhanAllah, in the end of it, what happened? In the end, they end up almost falling into sihr and falling into acts of disbelief because they sought help from someone who Allah Azza wa Jal did not give them permission to seek help from and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Um, bearing in mind the very short time that we have, I'm gonna ask you guys if you wanna stretch your legs, stretch your legs for two, three minutes. If you wanna go get a drink, get a drink. Uh, but please, we're not gonna have a, a proper break now, as in a 10 minute break or something like that. Two, three minutes, five minutes at the most. Stretch your legs, get some fresh air, and inshallah, we're gonna continue 
by talking about magic and the magician, inshallah ta'ala.